warm welcome to today's talk. It's Thursday the 12th of August. Now I've been studying a bit about diabetes and COVID for the last couple of days and um, of course we know that people with diabetes are more prone to getting more serious COVID-19. There's evidence starting to emerge from various countries that COVID-19 increases people's risk of developing diabetes. Now we hope it's not a lot but there does seem to be an element here so we're going to look at some of the research about that today. So what I think is a good idea if someone has had COVID-19 or indeed thinks they have had it then why not go to your healthcare provider and get your blood sugar checked because that's the simplest way to test for diabetes. And I'm going to show you how easy it is now. I'm just going to I'm just going to take my blood sugar. Hopefully it won't take too long at all and you'll see how uh, quick and easy the procedure is. So um, this is a fairly standard uh, testing unit for home testing. So I'm just going to give my finger a quick prick on the side like that. Can you see? There we go. I think we've just about got some blood. Yeah, there we go. These prickers are so atraumatic, really you hardly feel it. And then you put the blood sample on the test piece on there. There's a quick test. And then it gives us the result. So my blood sugar is currently 5.9, which is within the normal, normal, completely normal range. It's pretty amazing, really, because I, I, I had something to eat just about an hour ago. And now my blood sugar is 5.9. So that's absolutely fine. But anyway, that, that's it. That, that is it. I've just tested my blood sugar level. And from that, I don't see any indication, I'm pleased to say, that, that I'm developing uh, diabetes from, from that figure. So why not? If you've had COVID, you think you've had COVID, just go and get it checked. And it's, you know, it's the simplest, easiest thing. And then you can be reassured because the thing about diabetes is it can creep up on you. You can have it for a while and not know you've got it. This is the problem with diabetes. It's one of these iceberg conditions. So let's look at a bit of the background to this now. Um, so diabetes morbidity, how many people have diabetes? Well, in India, there's 77 million. In China, there's 116 million people with diabetes. In the UK, the latest count is 3.9 million, probably at least a, a million undiagnosed though. So up to, up to 4.7, 4.8, 4.9 million in actuality. And there's about 700 new cases diagnosed every day. The United States, the current figure from the CDC is 34.2 million people with diabetes at the moment. But you can at least double that, 60 or 70 million for people with pre-diabetes. So we see diabetes as already a huge burden of morbidity. So many people have diabetes and it causes so many complications. You know, it can cause complications to the eyes, it can cause complications to the heart and the blood vessels, and it can cause complications to the, to the kidneys and complications to the, uh, the peripheral blood flow, to the feet especially. All sorts of complications can be associated with diabetes. If it's badly managed, that's why you have to recognise it and control the blood sugar levels. So uh, now this came to my attention a couple of months ago, really. Uh, th th this um, rhinoorbital mucormycosis, th th this black fungus disease that was um, prevalent in India, is still quite prevalent in India, only seems to occur in people with high blood sugar levels. And it's not just India. It's been reported in quite a few countries, um, Egypt. Uh, there was quite a few cases as well, for example. Uh, following COVID-19 in previously non-diabetic immunocompetent patients. So this is this study here. India, there's been more than um, 45,000 cases of mucormycosis reported. Death rate's pretty high. It's about 50%. And that depends. And that's with good treatment. Affects the nose, the sinuses, the eyes, sometimes the brain with this black fungal disease. Usual onset 12 to 18 days after recovery from COVID-19. So this is being seen in patients who've had COVID-19. Now, um, there was 127 patients followed up. Um, 13 of those patients who developed my new mucormycosis had newly acquired diabetes mellitus. So in other words, 127 diabetic patients, but 13 of those were found not to have had diabetes prior to the episode of COVID. So that's already a fairly high proportion, isn't it? It's what, about 8 9% or something. Seems to have developed COVID as a result of the 
uh, seem to have developed diabetes as a result of the COVID or the treatment. Average age was only 36, so that's pretty young. Seven of the 13 not given steroids or supplementary oxygen. So of this 13, seven were not given steroids. Now, the steroids are the drugs that reduce the inflammation, as you probably know, and they put your blood sugar up as a side effect, but some had not been given that. And they hadn't been given supplementary oxygen, meaning they weren't particularly sick. So that was sort of an early indicator that, that got me thinking about this. Uh, this is a BBC report, Fears Over Sharp Rise in Diabetes in India. This is one of the doctors who's studying the problem of COVID and diabetes, a diabetologist, uh, Dr. Anoop Misra. Our assessment is that such patients were probably predisposed to diabetes because of obesity or family history. So she thinks that most of these patients probably were predisposed to diabetes anyway, and the COVID triggered it earlier, presumably, than it would have been triggered otherwise. But not all. Um, she does say that... Um, Severe diabetes caused by pancreatic damage is less common. So severe diabetes, where the pancreas is damaged, the part, the part of the body that actually makes the insulin is damaged, it exists, but she thinks it's less common than those where it was uh, simply triggered at an earlier stage. So not particularly reassuring, really. Then going on to this study here... Um, Proportion of newly diagnosed diabetes in COVID-19 patients, a systematic review, a meta-analysis, so looking at quite a few studies, published, peer review, published in Diabetes, Obesity and Metabolism Journal. Meta-analysis looked at eight studies, 3,700 patients. Now, they found that 14.4% of newly diagnosed uh, diabetics uh, in hospitalised patients, so in other words, 14.4% of patients that were hospitalised with COVID went on to develop diabetes. Now this is a remarkably high percentage. There are a couple of things to say though. These are hospitalised patients so clearly there were the patients that were sicker but still 14.4% is high. But of these eight studies to make up the 13,700 patients three of the studies were from China and in China um, as we've seen the prevalence of diabetes is very high so quite a few of those patients in China may have had the genetic predisposition that was just triggered earlier by the COVID-19. But nevertheless, has to be said, that is a high proportion, um, much higher than I would have expected for hospitalised patients. This gives us no information at all about how badly affected um, non-hospitalised patients were. We simply don't know that from this study. It wasn't looking at that. Uh, newly diagnosed diabetes may confer a greater risk for poor prognosis. In other words, people that have developed diabetes as a result of COVID-19, their COVID-19 probably has a worse prognosis. They're likely to do worse than people who already had known diabetes before. So it seems if the COVID-19 is bad enough to trigger the diabetes, it's associated with a, a, a greater mortality. Or it could be that something about the triggering of the diabetes itself triggers the increased mortality. We don't really know that yet. But this correlation is definitely there. We are now seeing a classic example. This is a direct quote from that paper of a lethal intersection between a communicable and a non-communicable disease. So the communicable disease, of course, is the COVID-19 um, and the non-communicable disease is the diabetes, indicating that a communicable disease, COVID-19, sars coronavirus 2 disease, can cause a, uh, a non-communicable disease, which is diabetes. So it's not that the patients are catching diabetes as such, but the virus appears to be predisposing to diabetes development. Now, they do give quite a few reasons for this. I'm just going to do these very briefly because we don't want to do too much physiology. But uh, stress responses associated with severe illness is one possibility. Diabetes can be associated with severe illness anyway, especially of an infectious nature. That can happen. Uh, treatment with the steroids, the glucocorticoids, could be a factor, but that's usually reversible. Normally, when we give people steroids, well, pretty well always, the blood sugar goes up. But then when we take them off the steroids, it goes down again. Uh, diabetogenic effects of COVID-19 should also be considered. So is the COVID-19 causing the increase in blood sugar, not the treatments? Um, some patients are noted to have a high degree of insulin resistance. Now, what this means, 
and we noticed this in intensive care back at the start of the well, we've known this for a long time, that, that people with COVID-19 often need higher doses of insulin to balance their blood sugar. So in hospital, as your blood sugar level rises, that will be tested, a very similar to tests that they've just, just done there. And the, the amounts of insulin that we're given will be titrated to get the um, blood sugars back down to a normal level. And a lot of people need higher doses of insulin to bring their blood sugar levels down. And presumably that's related to a degree of insulin resistance, which is a characteristic feature of type 2 diabetes in fact. Higher insulin requirements in uh, severely or critically ill COVID-19 patients with diabetes, we know that. Uh, more diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemia in COVID-19 patients with diabetes. In other words, that's the complication of type 1 diabetes. Your patients have type 1 diabetes, the insulin dependent diabetes, the autoimmune diabetes, but also more of this complication, this hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state that can develop in type 2 diabetes. So hyperosmolar means the blood becomes very osmotic, hyperglycemia means the blood sugar becomes very high, um, which is a classic complication of um, type 2 diabetes. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 may attach to the ACE2 receptor in the beta cells in the pancreas. Now the beta cells in the pancreas Pancreas is the organ at the top of the, is it just at the top of the, uh, top of the abdomen, just there, just un underneath various other bits and bobs. And of course, this is the organ, the pancreas, that produces the insulin. The particular cells in the pancreas that produce the insulin are the beta cells in the pancreatic islets of Langerhans that you may have heard of. Um, but these seem to have the uh, ACE2 receptors. In other words, the SARS coronavirus 2 can get in through the ACE receptor to infect these cells. This could be the mechanism here. Um, so that the virus could be directly damaging the cells, may also injure beta cells by pro-inflammatory cytokines that we've talked about before. We might remember we did a lesson once on the interleukin-6, which is one of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. A cytokine is a chemical which communicates between different cells. And in this case, because it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine, it will increase the amounts of inflammation. Uh, there may be enhanced autoimmunity in genetically predisposed people. Now, autoimmune diabetes... Uh, in type 1 diabetes, there's an autoimmune reaction where the body's own immune system beats up its own beta cells. And when all the beta cells are beaten up, there's no beta cells left to produce insulin, so the insulin levels go down. And if the insulin levels go down, that means that the glucose levels go up. So it may be triggering this type 1 diabetes process as well as the type 2 diabetes process. Also possible. ACE receptors are also expressed in the liver the fatty tissue, the adipose tissue in the skeletal muscle. And the thing about these is it's the liver and the skeletal muscle particularly that take the glucose in from the blood under the influence of insulin to lower blood sugar levels. And the idea of if, if there's ACE2 receptors in these, what you might call target organs, the liver, the fat and the skeletal muscle, if, if these cells are damaged by the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, or if the uh, insulin receptors are damaged by the SARS coronavirus 2, that may lead to what we call insulin resistance. So the actual target cells themselves might not be able to use the insulin as effectively. That's also a possibility and probably does occur in some patients. So that impairs the response to insulin. Um, so... Those things are all possible, so th this does make quite a lot of sense, unfortunately, that this could happen. Uh, so this article, Exploring Research, Can Coronavirus Cause Diabetes or Make It Worse? from the uh, diabetic website, Diabetes UK, their good website. Th they, they report this study uh, here. 47,000 people in England admitted to hospital for coronavirus 2 before August 2020, so the early part of the pandemic follow, follow them up for seven months and five percent of them went on to develop diabetes so from that original meta-analysis hospitalized patients it was um what was it four was it 14 and a half percent i can't remember now 14.4 percent in the original meta-analysis uh, went on to develop diabetes but as we said quite a few of those were in china which may have disproportionately affected the figures so 47,000 admitted patients to hospital, 5% of those went on to develop diabetes in the next seven months. Now that is a high proportion, 5% of hospitalised patients. So 
this means that hospitalised patients could potentially increase the amount of diabetes in the country quite significantly. Now, to what degree people with milder illness are at risk from diabetes, we don't know. It's probable they are at some degree of risk, but we can't put a figure on it because we simply don't know. But we do have that figure. 5% of people who went to hospital with COVID-19 went on to develop diabetes, either type 1 or type 2. So this is quite significant. And of course, if it turns out to be a similar percentage for people who weren't hospitalised, then that would be a bit of a health disaster. We're hoping that's really not the case, because given that maybe 20, 30 percent of the country has been exposed, 20 percent of the country has been exposed to the actual live virus to develop antibodies, as we know from blood donor surveys, that would be 5 percent of those would be an awful lot of people. Let's hope it's not that high, but we simply don't know yet. The studies are being done now. We should know that soon. But certainly that number 5% of hospitalised patients is, is a bit high, much higher than we'd like. Their chances, hospitalised patients were one time, were uh, one times 1.5 more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes after discharge compared to uh, people matched to their same ethnicity and age and background. So sort of 50% increase in the risk of diabetes in hospitalised patients over... Um, with a sample of 47,000 from last year. Now, of course, this tells us nothing about the Delta variant. This is the old wild type variant. This is even pre-alpha variant. So are there people waiting to come through with diabetes from alpha variant, from Delta variant? I'm afraid we don't know that, but we do know that 5% of these went on to develop diabetes. Uh, so this study is being done now. Um, uh, COVID diabetes registry, King's College London and some other universities. Click on there if you would like to take part in those studies. I always post the links, of course. So um, given the amount of people that have had COVID-19 around the world, this is a concern that there could be an awful lot of people developing type 1 and or type 2 diabetes, or type 1 or type 2 diabetes. I suppose some people could develop both. I mean, typically in, in the UK at the moment, about 90% of the cases of diabetes are the type 2 type of diabetes, about 10% of the type 1 diabetes. Um, in the States, actually, over the past few years, the, the incidence of new diabetic cases has been going down a bit as people are more health conscious, eating less sugary foods, trying to lose weight, doing more exercise. Um, so let's hope that situation is not reversed by the by the pandemic but this is something we need to follow up really closely and for you as an individual as you've just seen me do at the start of this video why not get your blood sugar checked and then you'll know then you don't have to worry about it maybe get your blood sugar checked every few months after that or something a very simple procedure um, as you've just seen now just looking at that i was looking at the same study here um Post-COVID syndrome in individuals admitted to hospital with COVID-19, retrospective cohort study. So this was 140-day follow-up. It was actually 47,780 people. Um, now, of that 47,780, in this 140-day period, 14,060 were readmitted. That's four times the admission rate of others in their same age group and uh, ethnicity and pre-morbidity category. And um, of that 14,060, 5,875 died after discharge within 140 days. Eight times higher rate than would be expected from an equal population. And the equal population control group was actually selected from about 40 million people in the UK. It was properly done. So probably means that the actual death figures for COVID-19 are lower because of the, the people that are dying after discharge from hospital, whose death might not be directly attributed to COVID-19, but they have a higher death rate. This is where I got the diabetes figures from. So there's more respiratory disease, disease significantly more uh, significant result. Um, diabetes, significant result. Cardiovascular disease, significant result. And there's also an increased rate of multi-organ dysfunction, pointing out the need to look at the individual as a whole. So there's this kind of... Um, bit of an iceberg of, of readmissions to hospital, uh, deaths, and, and these, certainly we know the diabetes, the cardiovascular disease, the respiratory disease associated with diabetes. And of course, you would say that these are older people very often with comorbidities. Yes, they are. But still, the readmission rate was four times higher than matched samples 
and the death rate was eight times higher than matched samples and the development of diabetes was 1.5 times what we would expect from matched samples representing 5% of the people that had been hospitalised went on to develop diabetes. And very often diabetes does not reverse it. Just If you've had it for several months, um, you, you may well have it essentially for life after that. So one to keep an eye on. Um, remember, just very simple. Test people, test yourself, then, th th then you'll know. Without this, without this blood test, actually, you're guessing. The only way to assess your blood glucose level properly is with a simple test like this. Or if you're getting your blood taken from a vein, uh, the surgery, um, in, in nurses or doctors taking it, then they can tick the glucose box as well when it's on a computer these days. They, 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 can click the compu they can click the glucose box and test it as well. Now, that's us for that topic. I, um, I think we'll go on and just get a couple of reports. We've got a bit of time today. One from Australia and then probably one from Uganda after that. So o over to uh, Dr. Nigel, first of all, Nigel Farrier in Australia. Thank you, of course, Nigel. Hello John and viewers, um, I'm recording this on um, Tuesday the 10th of August in Western Australia in the afternoon. Just thought I'd give you a quick update on Australia um, because uh, New South Wales has just had its worst day uh, ever. Um, they have now got 360 new cases. Four of those were from travellers, so they were in quarantine. So 356 new cases in the community and quite a goodly proportion of those were actually still infective and wandering around in the community. And a lot of these people are not really adhering to the rules and regulations. My son lives in Sydney and he's been telling me that um, these people are all going out without masks and because they're not allowed to congregate, they're having a meeting in the shopping centres. So they're getting a takeaway coffee and having a bit of a chin wag and um, without masks. So, yeah, it's no wonder that they're having such a, a bit of a problem. Um, so because of this, they've just got 356 new cases in the community. Um, now, they've had four deaths. Um, they had a two 80 year olds um, and a seven somebody in their 70s and two in their 80s um, none of these were vaccinated the fourth one was a return traveler so he didn't catch it locally the first three did and he was in his 80s so four deaths um, it's unfortunate but this is what is beginning to happen so currently in hospital in New South Wales, they've got 357 in hospital, 60 in intensive care and 28 on a ventilator. Um, over here in WA, we've still got one in intensive care and he's been listed as critical for some time now and he's a crew member of a cargo ship. Um, and the vaccinations still not going brilliantly. Um, we've got 44% um, of Australians 16 and over have had one dose and those over 70, it's 81.5. But if you look, it's only 23.1% have had two doses and 48% have had two doses in the over 70s. And as you've just seen, those people that are dying in hospital have not been vaccinated. Um, as horrible as that is, they're just not getting vaccinated. Um, talking of vaccinations, um, New South Wales did over 98,000 vaccinations yesterday, which is quite a good um, target. Um, they've got four and a half million. They're aiming to get a total of five million people having had at least one vaccination by the end of the week, and 6 million is their target, I believe, by the end of August. Now, in order to help that, um, the uh, Moderna vaccine is now approved. 
we should be getting in September 1 million doses imported, followed by 3 million a month for three months. That's 10 million Moderna vaccinations by the end of the year. Um, we're currently getting about a million a week imported from Pfizer and AstraZeneca are making about a million a week in Australia. So that's going to give us quite a few million doses of vaccination per week. We still need to increase that number, but if they get used, hopefully by December, we should have a goodly portion of the population vaccinated. Um, ATAGI, which is the um, advisory group on immunisations um, in Australia, have suggested or said that the AstraZeneca dose, we did have it at 12 weeks, they're now looking at bringing it back to four to eight weeks, certainly in New South Wales, to try and get more people fully vaccinated sooner rather than later. And the other thing with vaccinations is the um, federal government, in association with all the state governments, have agreed that aged care workers vaccinations are to be mandatory so by the middle of september they've all got to have had at least one vaccination whether or not you agree with making vaccinations mandatory that's yeah that's an argument that one could put don't make it mandatory but then if you don't there's going to be still a large portion of people that will not get vaccinated so i just thought i'd give you that quick update for um Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Useful, concise and accurate as always. Excellent. You know, the thing that's concerning me really is that the, the hospitalizations, 357 in Sydney, 60 in intensive care, 20, 20 on ventilators. That's a high proportion of poorly people. Spread this out round larger parts of Australia, even just parts of New South Wales, and the hospital capacity is going to be really, really struggling that is my concern but good news on the vaccination front excellent report Nigel thank you really appreciate that um, no substitute for getting the report from a doctor on the ground so that is great talking of doctors on the ground and we're going to have a report now from Wafafra about Africa as well uh, lots of you've been asking why Wafafra hasn't been on for a few days I didn't want to overdo it but <laughs> lots of people have been asking so um, he introduces his work a little bit and then and then he talks about the COVID situation in Uganda and Africa. So over to Wafafa. Thank you, Wafafa. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our channel. This is Wafafa Andrew. And on this channel, we share medical videos and uh, I also upload COVID-19 updates. And I'm also passionate about community health. So I usually upload uh, videos where I move to the communities, uh, sharing with people knowledge just with the aim of uh, putting information into their hands such that they can uh, make wise decisions about their health. Now, it has been a while since I last uploaded uh, COVID-19 updates for Africa and Uganda. Uh, this is just that uh, uh, because I've been in the community, busy doing a lot of work there. Uh, but I thank God that I'm now back and I thought it wise to upload today some COVID-19 updates. Now we are going to look at the COVID-19 situation in Africa and then we shall narrow down to Uganda, a country where I come from. Uh, in Africa, we are first going to look at the figures and then uh, we shall also talk about uh, uh, the vaccine situation in Africa and we shall do the same. Uh, in Uganda. Uh, when it comes to numbers, Africa has reported a cumulative number of about uh, 6.7 million confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 with about 5.9 million recoveries. So when you look at these numbers, uh, yes, num cases are increasing, but uh, the rate at which they are increasing, it has reduced compared to the month of June uh, and then uh, also towards early July. And also when you look at uh, the number of recoveries, they are very high. 
I think it is about 85%. So that means uh, out of 100 confirmed cases, about uh, 85 people uh, recover. So I think this is good news uh, for Africa. And uh, I think it is a bit difficult to explain because uh, the rate of vaccination in Africa is still low. But I think this is attributed to the fact that uh, Africa has one of the youngest population in the whole world. And then uh, it may be also due to cross immunity. Uh, this is because Africa suffer from a lot of infections in most cases. So it may be due to that. So let me know in the comment section what you think is bringing about this. Another information that I got is that the COVID-19 situation in Algeria uh, is bad. Uh, cases have overwhelmed the existing health facilities. So I have not gotten more information about that. Uh, if you're watching from Algeria, maybe you can tell us in the comment section. And you can also just tell us in the comment section the numbers and the general situation in your country, wherever you are watching from. Allow me to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine situation in Africa. When it comes to COVID-19 vaccination in Africa, we are facing three major challenges. One is COVID-19 vaccine shortages, and two, we have a problem of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, and then three, we have a challenge of uh, maintaining the cold chain. Uh, let me talk about these things. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19 shortages, uh, this is known uh, because out of uh, about 3.79 billion doses of uh, COVID-19 vaccines that have been administered worldwide, about only 62 million uh, doses have been administered in Africa. Uh, but the good news is that uh, uh, vaccines have started coming in Africa from different uh, countries like USA, UK, Norway, and others. And also African countries through the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Force has acquired about 400 million doses of uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccines. So I hope this is going to help to close the gap that is existing. And then when it comes to COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, now this is a worldwide problem, but in Africa it is <laughs> widely spread. Uh, many people are worried about the side effects of the vaccines. Many people believe that if they take the vaccines, they will not be able to produce and many other things. Now, I think I'm considering uh, to doing a brief research in my community and maybe I will be able to come up with a result. Let me wait when I get the resources, I will be able to do a research maybe about this uh, COVID-19 vaccine uptake and then I just want to uh, assess uh, what are people's ideas about COVID-19 vaccines. Yes, if I start on the research, I will let you guys know. Otherwise, the research that was conducted in, I think, Johannesburg University in South Africa showed that among the people who have refused to go for vaccination, uh, a certain percentage of them are worried about the COVID-19 side effects. Uh, now, when it comes to a gap in cold chain, um, uh, this is true because uh, most facilities in Africa don't have those facilities or those equipments that can help in maintaining uh, the cold chain, like the vehicles that are equipped with freezers that are supposed to uh, move those vaccines to the local health facilities. And then you also find that uh, uh, the local health facilities also lack the equipments or freezers that can store those vaccines. And yet they have to be maintained at a certain temperature for them to be used. So that is also a challenge uh, that we are facing in Africa. 
now uh let me know if you are watching and you come from africa let me know the general situation uh from wherever you are watching from and uh, now allow me uh summarize by talking about the general situation in uganda in uganda here the general situation is not uh very bad i think the lockdown that we just completed some few days ago was effective uh, because prior to the lockdown we had a positive rate of above 20 percent but as i talk even after the lockdown was relaxed uh, the positive rate has not yet gone up we have a positive rate of about 4.5 percent uh, that means that out of 100 people that are tested uh, we have a chance of getting around four to five people turning positive i think that is good news uh, but the only bad news is um, the vaccination rate in uganda is still low i think about uh, let me get the figures about uh, 1,152,874 doses of vaccines have been administered so far. And uh, about 80% uh, of the people who have received the vaccines have just received their first dose. Uh, so we still have low uh, vaccine coverage rates uh, because our target is to cover about 22% millions but as i talk uh we have not even fully covered one million when it comes to the number of cases confirmed uh, uganda has reported a cumulative number of about 94,904 cumulative cases as per today and we have reported a cumulative number of about 87,633 recoveries i think that is a good number as you can see the rate of recovery is still high in uganda and we have around 581 active cases uganda has reported a cumulative number of about 2752 deaths including uh, 18 new Death. So uh, when it comes to treatment, uh, symptomatic cases in Uganda, uh, we put them uh, on vitamin C and then we also recommend uh, them to be on a balanced diet that includes a lot of fruits, a lot of uh, greens or vegetables. And then we also recommend physical exercises and we also recommend people to have some a regular sun bathing that is about 20 minutes per day uh, for those serious cases uh, they are putting them on some antibiotics like azithromycin they also put them on corticosteroids like dexamethasone and then uh, we also use analgesics like paracetamol and uh, they also use oxygen uh, for those ones who are having uh, difficulties in breathing now thank you very much for watching hope you found this video uh, helpful if you're new here uh, kindly consider subscribing like and share this video with all the people you care about and also let me know how we can improve the videos here because as i told you i'm not perfect but every day I want to improve so i welcome all your ideas i love you all god bless you peace <laughs>
Um, sun, of course, for the vitamin D, you know, get your shirt off, get some all over exposure, 20 minutes without getting burnt, as he says. Uh, steroids, when someone's got an inflammatory reaction, of course, and typically in the second week. Erythromycin, I'm not so sure about the evidence for that, unless there's a lot of the secondary bacterial infection. Oxygen, of course, can be completely life saving. And paracetamol, well, paracetamol, of course, will, if someone's got a fever, paracetamol will bring the fever down. And of course, what we have to remember when we're considering whether to give paracetamol or not is the fact that fever is the body's natural response to infection and actually aids the immunological process. So uh, quite questionable, really, whether paracetamol is appropriate if someone has a fever. Personally, I don't like giving it if people, adults have a fever. OK, so there we go. I uh, hope that was useful. Um, gone on a bit today but th there you go the two excellent reports so th th thank you Nigel and thank you Wafafa for those reports and thank you for watching